Good morning. Please take a seat. Right. I'm not reading out any notices today because Judith has very kindly put them all out on this. If you haven't got one, please see Judith and she'll happily supply you with one. I'd like to welcome you all here today to St. David's and to those who are watching online either now or later. And I'd like to introduce Chris, who's leading the service today, and Bethan will later be holding the communion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And as Irene has said, it is communion this morning, so particularly if you're watching at home and you want to join in, then you may at some point want to find bread and wine or whatever you prefer to use so that you can join with us in the second part of the service. The psalmist wrote, listen to what I have to teach you. Listen to the things we have known and heard for generations. We will tell those coming after us, the next generation, the wonderful deeds of the Lord of his power and the wonders he has wrought. And so we're going to offer now our prayer for growth. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give vision to our planning, joy to our worship, wisdom to our actions, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we turn to our first hymn this morning. It's from Rejoice and Sing. Now, the words may be unfamiliar to some people, but Hilary has found a tune which many of us will know. So it's 534, Lord. As I wake, I turn to you. Thank you very much to our musicians and our singers and to everyone that's made it possible for us to worship here this morning. 
I know I've said before, it takes a lot of people. We have to open up. We have to get the teas and coffees ready. Richard on technical has to get everything sorted. People have to lay for communion and all the other things that go on. So thank you very much to everybody who helps with that. Now let us join together in our prayers. And our prayers will conclude with the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our hearts are to you as an open book. Before we speak, you know our words. Before we have thought, you know what we desire. Before we have consciously decided on what we want, you know how we will act. We can hide nothing from you, for you watch over us and with us. Our secrets, the ones that we hold most dear and most tightly, are known by you. And you understand us and still love us with a deep, abiding love that never lets us go, never moves away, never loosens its hold. As we come before you now, may our hearts be cleansed, our thoughts made pure, and our actions be directed by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Help us to love you better. Help us to speak your name aloud with hope and love and grace. For you sent Jesus into this world for each one of us, those of us who are gathered here today and those who have yet to hear his name and of his loving sacrifice. And so we bring our prayers of thanks. Almighty God, we thank you for those of your people who have gone before us, those that we read about in the Old Testament, those whose lives and experiences from that time may inspire us, people such as David and Ruth, Moses or Miriam, the prophets and the judges. And so in the silence, we remember one and give you thanks for their life, for their experience, for their words to us today. And we remember those in the New Testament that we may also look to. Joseph, Mary, Peter, Martha, Paul, Dorcas, many others. In the silence, we remember one of those and give you thanks for the inspiration that they can still give us today. We recall those in our past who have played their parts in our faith journey. There may be someone from long ago, parents and grandparents, teachers, maybe junior church staff, uniformed officers in the boys' brigade or something similar, ministers here or in other places and at other times, members of the fellowship who reached out to us, supported us, encouraged us, in the silence, we remember one and give you thanks. And we remember those that we have helped on their faith journey, those we have encouraged in our turn, those we have spoken your word to, those who needed a friend and we were able to be there for them, those we might have supported through prayer or companionship or fellowship or in a practical way. And in the silence, we remember one and give you thanks that in your name, 
we were able to help them. And Almighty God, we thank you for others who are reaching out to those who have yet to learn about you, for ministers and pastors, local church leaders and church-related community workers, those who work with young people and those in other specialised ministries. Help us to be supportive of them and willing to take our turn at speaking your word when the opportunities arise. And Almighty God, we thank you for the wonders you have done. This world called into being, made from nothing, amazing in its complexity, diversity, and sheer size. We thank you for the small things, the grains of sand, the ants we see in our gardens, for the big things such as oceans and the galaxies, and for the middle-sized things, the animals, the plants. And for the things that we cannot see, love and hope and grace, mercy and kindness, things which affect our lives every day. We thank you too for the gift of the Holy Spirit who inspires and challenges us. And for Jesus, your Son and our eternal Saviour, who taught his followers to pray in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to have our first reading from the Bible, which Mike is going to read for us. Thank you. It's from Matthew 21, verses 23 to 27. The authority of Jesus is questioned. Jesus entered, entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why do you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold up John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Uh, but the grace of God go away. Thank you very much. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're asked to take over a club, a group, an organization, a company, as their top manager. Perhaps your favorite football club, I don't know, Liverpool, Man U, Chelsea, whoever. Perhaps you'd rather be in charge of Marks and Spencers, get them to change some of the dreadful clothes they seem to put out at the moment, I don't know. Or Sainsbury's, or Primark, or John Lewis, or one of those. Imagine the power you would have. You'd be able to make any changes you wanted. You'd be able to hire and fire at will. What power is yours?
But in reality, few of us have the experience or the practice or the vision to take up such a position. Because to have the real authority to make the changes you would want, even sort of a small thing to say, well, let's not have anything else in those dreadful colours or, you know, whatever. Um, as a friend of mine said, some of Marks and Spencer's stuff like, looks like Laura Ashley, only not nearly as good. You know? What do you need if you're going to change that? Well, you need a track record, don't you? You need to have experience of what you're doing so you know how these things work. You need the respect of those who are working with you and for you. And you need to be able to realize and release the potential of your staff. Because spin only gets you so far, doesn't it? Soon the football fans or the customers or the shareholders will realize that actually you don't know what you're doing and they're going to demand change, aren't they? Before everything that has been worked for so hard is lost forever. Jesus did not come to wield the sort of coercive authority that perhaps we too often see in our world. He wasn't trying to force people to change, to force them to do what he wanted, to make them follow him. He invited, he said, come and see. He came to serve others, not to be served, not to have the trappings of power, but to show the Father to those who were afraid. He came not to lord it all over the others, but to give fullness of life to those who were searching for it. In him, we can be all we can be and all we were meant to be but we can find it hard. And sometimes perhaps we struggle to see clearly what it is God is doing and how he operates and how it affects us. And maybe we think that those who are wise in the ways of this world are the ones that we should be following. But God's grace, of course, is not confined to those of whom our world approves of and applauds. And nor is his revelation only for those that we see as being the great and the good. We all need to be open to God's grace and to his revelation wherever it comes from, through those we approve of and those we don't really like at all, from unexpected avenues, people and places we'd not considered, but that God, of course, can use when he speaks to his people. And in the reading we heard, we heard that the chief priests and the leaders of the people asked Jesus where does your authority come from? And Jesus didn't answer it, did he? He counted it. He asked a question of his own. You tell me about John's baptism. Did that come from human origin or was it from heaven? And if you can answer me that question, I'll tell you where my authority comes from. And Matthew tells us that they refused to answer because either answer was uncomfortable. They didn't want to come down on one side or the other. Because if they said that John's authority came from heaven, then everyone, including Jesus, would want to know why they hadn't believed and hadn't changed their ways, hadn't done what John had asked. But if they declared it was not from heaven, then they thought the people might well riot because they held John in high reverence as a prophet. Jesus was forcing them not to evade the truth, but rather than state a definite conclusion, they did the equivalent of, I'm sure you've seen this, particularly among children, you may well have done it yourself, of taking your bat home because the game is not going your way. So they equivocate, don't they? They don't say one thing or the other. They say, we don't know. I suppose, is it a bit like the, any, anyone from Scotland? Scottish? They have a thing called not proven in a court of law, don't they? You can be guilty, not guilty, or it can be not proven against you. 
And I think that's where the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law are sitting here. It's not quite proven yet. And Jesus refuses to be drawn further, doesn't he? He says, look, if you can't work that one out, what is the point of me telling you where my authority lies? Because you won't believe it if I told you. And sometimes, perhaps, we want to avoid the truth because we find it a little bit overwhelming. I know one of the truths I find overwhelming is that Jesus was sent by God for the forgiveness of of my sin and your sin and yours and yours and yours but mine so it's not just those sitting next to you not just those we think we might deserve it but your sin and my sin those of you who were at cafe church a few weeks ago may remember the song that judith played for us it's called you say and i'm not sure how she pronounces her name Lauren Daigle, would that be right? Thank you, Richard. It says, you say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. You say I'm held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I am yours and I believe what you say of me. But I find that sometimes that bit is the hard bit. And to act on that. Sometimes we find things hard to believe, but it doesn't make them false. And I sometimes wonder if I want to avoid this wonderful truth, this marvelous truth, because it means accepting I actually have to do something about it. And people can misuse their authority, can't they? Perhaps power goes to their heads and they forget the responsibilities that go with power. And even within churches, we've seen examples of that. Jesus uses his divine authority to serve, not to dominate, to bring love, not fear, to speak words of forgiveness, not words of condemnation. May we go and do likewise. Amen. We're going to sing again. This is from um, Combined Mission Praise. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. from on page 989, Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. It's headed the parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. 
Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteous, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Hilary. <laughs> Sorry, I know you're busy today. <laughs> The first part of this teaching is quite straightforward, isn't it? It's about obedience, about doing what we're asked to do. Sometimes we do it unwillingly. Sometimes we're perhaps a little bit resentful about it. And I'm sure we've all been there. We have said, no. No, we're not going to the birthday party. No, we're not going to the prayer group. No, we're not going to watch our grandchildren's concert. No, to whatever it is we're being asked to do. But later, we think maybe, perhaps, we really need to. We need to turn up. We need to show our support. We need to perhaps encourage somebody else. We need to keep somebody company. And perhaps when we get there, we find it was the right thing to do. We enjoyed it, or we didn't dislike it as much as we thought we were going to. We perhaps meet an old friend there, or we make a new one. We might have made it easier for somebody else to attend. And sometimes it is as bad as we thought it was going to be. But hey, that's life, isn't it? You know, just put it down to experience. The other brother, of course, was the opposite. He readily agreed to help out and then didn't turn up. And in a way, that's a bit worse, isn't it? Because people are relying on us. And somehow, I don't know, we wrote the date down wrong, double booked ourselves, or maybe we never had any intention of going at all. We were always going to uh, forget about it, weren't we? And here Jesus is talking about the difference between saying and doing. As we've heard, many people can talk the talk in whatever sphere they find themselves, but what we need are those who can walk the walk as well. When we're at work, we want bosses, we want managers who understand what's needed, how much effort it's going to take, what the pitfalls are likely to be, rather than just those, and I'm sure we've all worked for them at one point or another, they turn up, they make insane demands, and then walk away from the chaos that they have just initiated. Yes, there's one or two smiles and nods. We've all worked for people like that. One, says, one son said he would but he didn't, and the other said he wouldn't, but did. And I wonder what kind of people Jesus wants us to be. Jesus is still talking here to the chief priests and to the leaders of the people. And I wonder if he was accusing them of too much talk and not enough action, of hiding behind their scholarship and their secular authority. Were the things that they were doing an outward expression of inward obedience? Or was too much of it just for show? And we're quite used to this story, aren't we? The two sons. But not perhaps the end of it. Because here we, he we hear a radical statement about those who are entering the kingdom of God. Here Jesus is saying that those like the chief priests and the other leaders will perhaps find that they are not at the front of the queue to get in. They will find others ahead of them, tax collectors whom nobody liked because they worked for the occupying Roman force and they had a tendency to extort money from their clients. Prostitutes, those considered to be right at the very bottom of the social pile and religious pile. Those people who, for those at the top, would never give the time of day to. And it's these people, Jesus says, because they have listened and believed 
who will enter the kingdom before the, those who talk a good talk but do not walk a good walk. I wonder how the chief priests felt going home that day. And I wonder what we think about it as well. But now we're going to take the offering. Thank you. Loving and generous God, we thank you for all the things that we've received from your hand. And we offer these gifts back to you. Gifts of money that we have offered this morning, gifts of money that we have offered in other ways, and other gifts that we have. May they be used well in your work here at St. David's and in the wider community. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, our next song is from Combined Mission Praise, if you want to follow the words. But uh, as we had a different tune, and we were trying to sort things out, and Hilary has had a very, very busy week, um, we didn't feel that you would feel up to um, learning a new song. So it's going to play on the screen. But that doesn't mean you can't join in if you feel like it. I'm not going to ask you to stand. So if you want, just want to listen to it and watch the video, that's fine. But if you feel that you could handle the singing, then do feel free to join in the singing. Now, this is the technical bit that I never know. Richard says, I just press this button once. And do you think it's something that we might be able to learn? 
Wonderful, yes. Oh, right, Hilary, we'll have to put it down for one that we'd like to learn. Thank you. Right. Okay, so we're going to have our prayers of confession, um, which have a response. So I will say, Lord God, and the response is, have mercy on me, and I will leave that up on the screen. And then when we get to the end of that, Lisa is going to, Lisa, sorry, is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession and our local prayers. So let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, we are your people, and as such we proclaim your greatness. We sing of your majesty and rejoice in all that you do. But as we bring our praises to you, we can find ourselves saddened. For despite our best efforts, we sometimes find it hard to live as you want us to, and to follow the example of our crucified and risen Lord. There are times when our praise has rung hollow, when our words die on our lips, when we forget your goodness, and when our own concerns become so overwhelming that we forget you and your love for us. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess that sometimes our worship remains within these walls, that the hour we spend here is the only time that you are in our thoughts or directing our actions. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess that we miss opportunities to speak your name to others. We forget to talk of your love and mercy. We are silent when we should be willing to share the good news of Christ with those around us. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess that moments pass us by when we call to serve you when others need us but we hold back, when someone needs to be held to account, when those who are unsure could be encouraged, when those who grieve could be comforted, and those who hesitate could be challenged in love. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess the times when we have known what we should do but have held back, when we've been fearful when we've waited for someone else to step in, or we have misjudged the moment. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess the times when we should not have done things, but went ahead and did them anyway. Moments when we spoke sharply or without all the information we needed. Occasions when we did more harm than good. Times when we were too concerned with ourselves to wait and find a better moment. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess that we have forgotten that you were always ready to forgive and renew us, and so have allowed ourselves to become burdened with feelings of guilt or despair or self-loathing. You are a God of love and mercy, who wants the best for each one of his people. Remind us of this over and over again. Lord God, have mercy on me. We confess that we do not always practice what we preach, that sometimes we deny what we say by the way we act, that our discipleship can be weak, that our faith can be feeble, and that we let you down. Lord God, have mercy on me. Help us to live in such a way that our words and deeds may be as one. May our faith be real and alive so that our lives bear witness to the sacrifice of Christ and his victory over death itself. It is for his sake that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we continue in prayer, gracious and loving God, thank you for the seasons we can count on, find and routine in, and that will never cease while the earth remains. As we enter into autumn, when the cooler winds drift in and the days grow shorter, draw us closer to you and let us feel your warm and loving presence. 
Father God, we pray for those engaged in work of mission, seeking to spread the good news of your love. We remember those who witness their faith in societies where it is too dangerous to open and become declared being a Christian. Keep them safe and give them encouragement to all the agencies which seek to support them. May we strive to live active lives which draw people to know of your goodness in a world where there is often fear and despair. Merciful God, we see so much pain and suffering in the world, so much anger, frustration and despair. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the needs of those around us, but we know nothing is impossible for you. We pray for those who make peace in this divided world, for all the national leaders that may have the wisdom to know and the courage to do what is right, that their hearts may be turned to you in search for righteousness and truth. We continue to pray for all those suffering around the world who are affected by natural and man-made disasters. May all the efforts to reconcile the lost and displaced, the refugees and the injured may be met with the help they are needed. Please take a moment to pray for any country which is on your mind right now. God of power, we pray for those here and abroad affected by financial uncertainty and are concerned about job security, fearing the loss of homes and savings. Forgive us our greed, which causes so many of these world's problems. May we learn to live simply with fewer possessions content with what we have and to place value not on material wealth but upon the really important things such as love of friends and family. Give wisdom to all who make decisions and develop policies which affect the economies of the, economies of the world. You have called us here to love one another, work together with one heart and mind. May our church be a place of welcome, love and inclusion. Bless our outreach within the local community as we seek to meet the needs around us and help us work alongside the initiatives to feed the hungry and shelter for the homeless, safety for the vulnerable. God of compassion, we are mindful of people living in circumstances of domestic abuse, fearful each day not knowing where to turn for help. Give them courage to seek refuge and strength and to walk away from situations which have placed them in danger. Be with those who are afraid to give them knowledge of your presence in whatever difficulties they face. Loving God, bless all who find life difficult at this time. We pray for those who have to make hard decisions this week. We remember those who are having a hard time at home, at work or school. All who are suffering humiliation, prejudice, loneliness or isolation. We pray for children who are being bullied in school. And we pray for all who are brought low by sickness, physical, mental or spiritual. We are going to pray for those in our prayer book this morning. We are grateful thanks for the team who organised Ladies' Day of Worship yesterday. We pray for Teresa and Barbara. We pray for all those affected in the coach crash on the motorway earlier this week. We pray for Amber, Carl, John... Margaret, and we thank God for the safe arrival of Maisie Keenan. Gather all those names in your loving arms, and may they be aware of your presence with them. As we go out into this coming week, may we be challenged to respond to the truth of the gospel and be humble and obedient as we seek to live in a way which draws people to the love of God. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. We're going to sing in a moment, but uh, I just want to explain something that's about going to happen after communion. I know a few people have said they're finding it difficult to know what to do with their communion glasses after they finish communion, because we don't have anywhere to put them anymore. So we're going to try an experiment this morning. So after you finish communion, just keep hold of your glasses. During the final hymn, Judith on this side and Lisa on that side will send a little basket round. So put your glass in the basket. The people at the front, if
if you're the last person to get it, either put it on a chair next to you or put it under your seat. Anyway, you're not going to trip over it, please, no tripping. Um, which means so that by the time we finish the hymn, everybody should have got rid of their little glass and then the people who are clearing up can collect them and take them to be washed. So we'll try it this week and see how it goes. And if you like it, we can carry on. And if you don't, then please think of another way of dealing with the glasses. Okay. I'm going to hand over to Bethan shortly because Bethan is going to preside at communion and she has chosen our communion hymn from Rejoice and Sing. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. I invite you to this table in the name of the one who said, I <laughs> This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is here that we remember how he gave his body and his blood to save us. On the night he was handed over, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and after giving thanks to God, broke it and gave it to his disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. 
Thank you, Jesus, for loving us even unto death. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink at your table in our congregation and around the world are one body, one holy people. As we take the bread, we eat it as we are served it. The bread of life, Jesus' body broken for us. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine and after giving thanks, said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, drink it, remember me. As we take the wine, we'll retain it and we'll, drink, we'll all drink together. Blood of Christ was shed for us. The blood of Christ was shed for us. We have come to the Lord's table. We have eaten the bread of heaven. The Holy Spirit will transform us from within so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, and speak with Jesus' mouth. Feel the world as Jesus feels, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Go into your week nourished by the bread of life. And our final hymn this morning is Go Forth and Tell.
let us go in peace. May we return to God's world doing all that is honourable, just and pure. May we remember all that has happened here, all that we have learned and all that we have shared, so that we may do the will of the Father through the name of the Son and in the power of the Spirit. And now, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us and those whom we love, now and always. Amen. starts to play the organ music I have one notice which is additional to what's on the sheet uh, those of you who are intending going to Margaret's funeral if you are intending to go on to Prenton Golf Club after could you give me your name please because David would like some idea of numbers for who is going thank you <laughs> 